Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Research Office webinar. This event is being brought to you by the EPSRC University Partnerships team. I'm Anne Chalkley, a Portfolio Manager in the team. Other members of the team on the call are Kerry Ann Whitehead, Ben Rendell, and Maeve Ann McCune. McClune. The agenda for the webinar remains as it was on the registration form. So we'll be starting with a presentation on trusted research and innovation, followed by some information about the claim process for disabled student allowance, and then an update on the transition to the funding service. Do note that as we are covering multiple topics, this will be an update. So do see the UKRI and EPSRC TFS web pages for background and more details, and look out for other comms that will more specifically address TFS. Finally, there will be a Q&A session, which brings me on to a couple of housekeeping points. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions. The Q&A session will be after the three presentations, but you can put your questions in at any point, uh, and the earlier the better. We will record the presentations and share the video on our webpage in a week or so, and we'll also share the slides by email. I will now pass over to Katie Daniel for the trusted research session. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to today's webinar. So my name is Katie Daniel. Um, I'm a deputy director within the Partnerships Directorate at EPSLC, and um, I'm responsible for our university relationships, uh, as well as regional engagement and place. Um, and as part of my responsibilities, I take an interest in uh, trusted research and innovation. So that's what I'm going to talk to you um, about today. There are a couple of areas that I'm going to cover. So I'm going to uh, cover a little bit about the, the current national context, so the, the kind of wider picture um, around trusted research. Um, and then I'm going to a bit go into a bit more detail about EPSLC's uh, due diligence process in terms of what we do internally um, around the grants that we support. So in terms of the, <clears throat> the current context, Next, so I thought I would just kick off with um, what trusted research and innovation is for, for anyone that, that is not aware. Um, so trusted research is a sector term for protecting the UK's uh, intellectual property, sensitive research, people and infrastructure from uh, potential theft, manipulation and exploitation, including uh, interference by hostile actors. So UKRI established a Trusted Research and Innovation Work Programme a couple of years ago, um, and that's intended to help manage and provide guidance and support in ensuring uh, internationally collaborative activities are done safely and securely, and also to minimise the risks associated with operating within a global research and innovation ecosystem, whilst also still being able to maximise the opportunities of being in, within that kind of global um, system. Uh, so one of the things that we try to do is uh, to work closely with, with our partners um, across the sector, so both um, kind of within universities, but also within uh, kind of government as well, um, and look for where a coordinated approach um, could be useful. There's also some information that you can find uh, online, uh, which is published by the National Protective Security Authority, um, whose website has guidance for academia and industry. Um, and they stress um, that the importance of having that thriving research and innovation sector um, and that we want to really attract investment from across the world into the UK. Um, more than half of the UK research uh, that, that's um, out there is a product of international partnerships. So, so it is very important to the UK and the research endeavour as a whole. And through doing this, we, we aim to secure the integrity of the system of international research collaboration so we, we can continue that success of the, the UK's research and innovation sector. Through their framework, um, they try to help uh, manage risks associated with the international collaboration. I think particularly uh, to emphasize here is um, around emerging technologies, which is very relevant to the EPSLC portfolio given the nature of, of the, the areas that we support. Um, it also tries to help outline the potential risks uh, to UK research and innovation. 
um, to help uh, researchers, UK universities and industry partners have, have confidence uh, around international collaboration and make informed decisions about uh, any potential risks. And also some information on how to protect staff, uh, res protect research and staff from uh, potential uh, theft and exploitation. So one thing I really wanted to stress in this presentation was how complicated uh, this landscape is that sits around trusted research and how often it changes. Um, I think if there's if there's anything that you take away from this presentation, then that's probably a, a really important uh, point um, that the geopolitical situation uh, changes um, all of the time. Obviously, we, we've now got uh, kind of new wars happening. Um, there's ongoing uh, conflicts um, around the world which can, can influence um, the position of the UK government on working with particular countries. Um, and uh, so positions change uh, over time as well. So a few things that I just wanted to, to highlight, and this is by no means an exhaustive uh, list of things to, to kind of consider in the landscape, is um, the work of the research collaboration advice team. So they sit within um, our parent department, DSIT, um, and they're there to provide advice to uh, the sector and work in partnership with the sector around issues uh, around national security and try and help sort of demystify um, some of that. So we really encourage you to engage with them. I know a lot of universities um, already are very engaged with them. Um, there was a, a recent uh, review of the, uh, a refresh of the integrated review, um, which looked at some of our international relationships and, and what the, the kind of government position on some of those would be. Uh, there was a National Security and Investment Act was published in 2021, um, and that gives some areas of technology which uh, we need to be more uh, aware of and uh, are controlled in certain ways. There are uh, sanctions which are monitored by the Office for uh, Financial Sanctions Implementation within the Treasury, and that's definitely something to be um, aware of and make sure that um, you know, you're complying with the sanctions regimes. There was a recent report um, a little bit earlier this year uh, on China by the Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament, and that particularly highlighted engineering and physical sciences um, as an area uh, of potential uh, sort of concern to, to them. And also the, there's export control, which has obviously been around for a while, but continues to be uh, relevant within this uh, context. And there are, there are many other things uh, as well that, that sit um, around this. There's plenty of, of tools and, and guidance uh, out there um, to, to help you. So we, we encourage you to, to look for, for that. Um, but the one thing that I did want to, to make sure people were aware of uh, on here was um, that since 2021, UKRI has required some enhanced due diligence on international collaborations, um, and that is part of our terms and conditions. Um, and also to be aware that our terms and conditions are retrospective as well as forward looking. So as well as applying to, to the new awards um, that we put out, um, it also applies to our existing grant holders um, as well. Um, and I think that's something that particularly our, our award holders are not always aware of these new um, requirements coming along. And hopefully you can help us um, in making sure that that, that is disseminated within uh, the university sector. So moving on to a bit more about what we do specifically in, in EPSRC. Um, so we, we, we do slightly different things depending on whether um, we're looking at our current portfolio or our new portfolio. Um, so I'm going to spend most of the time talking about our new portfolio um, during this, but just to stress in terms of our, our current portfolio, we do monitor uh, the portfolio of collaborative projects that, that we support um, because we need to ensure they reflect uh, current best practice and wider government policy. Um, and we do look to work with universities where that's required. So it, it is possible that, um, you know, we may approach universities or uh, grant holders at any time uh, to discuss uh, current awards with them in the context of, of trusted research. So in terms of our, our new portfolio, this is where I'm, I'm going to focus more, as I said. Um, EPSRC's uh, due diligence approach really focuses on uh, project partners um, that we see on the grant proposals um, and also visiting researchers. 
So what kind of partnerships are we do we specifically look for um, and what should you be aware of and you know be aware that we are going to be specifically looking for? Um, so in terms of project partners and visiting researchers, we look for those that are based uh, in a country that the UK currently has active arms embargo, trade sanctions or other trade, trade restrictions um, with. And you can find a list of those on the government website. It's quite, it's quite a long list. Um, but obviously, there are some countries where you know, we do a lot more international collaboration with than others. Um, the other aspect that's important to consider is um, where there are uh, companies that you're partnering with uh, or the academics are partnering with, where the majority ownership is based in one of the countries on that list as well, even if the location of the company is actually in the UK or another country that is not on that list. Um, that is something that um, we also expect people to, to look at. So I thought I'd uh, summarise the, the process that we go through with our, our new projects when they come in and, and point out the, the three areas where I think research office staff can be uh, of most help uh, to both the, the academic community and to EPSOC in, in flagging certain things. Um, so obviously you have preparing the proposal, submitting the proposal. At that point, um, EPSOC looks for uh, data on project partners and visiting researchers with the countries on the list um, that I've suggested. Nothing else happens at that stage. It's just a flag on the proposal. The proposal is then peer reviewed as normal. If the proposal is then recommended for funding, we will then uh, look in more detail at those partnerships um, where a flag was put on the proposal um, in the first place. At that point, we may come out um, then to the university uh, for more information or to have a discussion about the proposal uh, and the partnerships. Following that, we will take a decision on any proposed risk mitigations that might need to be put in place. The grant would then be funded with uh, the standard terms and conditions in place. Um, and then obviously, the, when once the grant is live, the terms and conditions may be updated. So it's important to be aware that um, people need to, to keep an eye on those through the lifetime. So in terms of um, where you can help uh, most, I think it's in terms of the preparation of the proposal and uh, talking to the, the academic teams about um, what they might need to think about in, when they're putting their proposal together and the partnerships they're, they're suggesting. Uh, in some of those discussions we might come and have with the universities, I think particularly if you have uh, professional staff who uh, focus on trusted research, they're very valuable to have in those conversations with, with EPSRC. Um, and also in terms of the live portfolio and making sure that that is monitored uh, through the lifetime. So what actions might EPSLC take uh, if we if we feel we need to once we get to that um, grant funding point? So um, firstly, we will see if we feel there's sufficient information or we think the partnership is uh, low risk otherwise. In that case, we, we are unlikely to, to come and approach the, the PI or the university. Um, but if there are any potential concerns or a lack of information, we will come out to people. So we will discuss the partners with the principal investigator or other stakeholders from the university, as I suggested. Um, we might ask for more information on the nature of the partnerships. We might request details of mitigations or do you agreed um, or those that um, the university or the PI is, is suggesting that they put in place. And in some circumstances, we may add an additional condition to the offer letter that's specific to that proposal to ensure that specific actions are taken as agreed. So I thought it might be uh, helpful to talk about when we might consider a project to be of higher risk um, in terms of the, the partnerships um, that it has. So we would be looking for projects where the research areas or technologies may be subject to export control or uh, are controlled under the National Security and Investment Act. We'll look for where there might be potential for dual use. I think importantly to say even where that is not explicit in the proposal, that is something we'll obviously um, look at. There may be a lack of information on the nature of the collaboration or how the partner will interact with the project. So I think that's something where you could look at what is the information that's contained in things like the letter from the project partner or within the, the wider um, sort of scope of the application. 
It may be we don't have information on how IP or data will be protected. It may be that it appears the partner or visiting researcher may have access to the UK infrastructure, such as facilities or labs, um, or maybe data or data resources, particularly if that's uh, potentially sensitive data. It may be staff are, are going to spend time overseas in a university or business environment within that country. Um, or it may just be that safeguards or mitigations against those risks um, are not presented within the proposal. So in terms of what assurance or mitigation we might require, so the, the things on this slide are probably uh, generic across uh, any proposals where we would we would come out to talk to the university. So we would be looking for more detail on the nature of the activities with the partner and a plan to ensure that information sharing is kept to a level appropriate to those activities and that IP will be protected. Um, the assurances that a signed legal collaboration agreement will be uh, in place before any information is shared with the partner, that the university will be uh, performing ongoing monitoring with respect to export control and the NSNI Act. Um, if there's a consortium within the project where there are different universities or research organisations, we will want to make sure that they all understand their obligations um, around all of these different things as well. Um, and we'll want confirmation if the, that particular research area or project has previously been discussed with the research collaboration advice team or with the National Protective Security Authority, because that can give us some assurance that, that you've thought about that in more detail. What if we consider uh, a research area to be of a much higher risk or perhaps the partner is, is quite directly engaged in the research, so there we might request um, more uh, mitigations are put in place. So we might need things, more things in writing in terms of uh, around the joint research or information sharing um, and uh, may request to see uh, documents, uh, for example, the collaboration agreement prior to those being um, signed off. Um, we may want assurance that there'll be no deviation from the collaboration agreement unless um, that is first approved by EPSRC. We may want to see terms of reference of advisory structures that that partner is involved with um, and making sure uh, that, again, um, you know, we have access to those at any time during the life of the award. We may request regular updates on the status of the relationship or an EPSRC contact might be assigned to the grant for monitoring purposes. And in some kind of more uh, extreme circumstances, we may mutually agree to the removal of a partner. I would say that is not something we do um, very regularly, but um, it may happen. So this is my final slide. I just thought I'd do a, a quick summary. So um, we're operating in a complex system uh, and changes to be expected. Um, and that's why we would like to make sure that you uh, monitor the risk of collaborations over the lifetime of a partnership, not just at the beginning of the project. Um, we feel that everyone in the research sector has a responsibility to consider their role in protecting the research um, that we support. Um, and that goes from you know, the research team through the university support teams to the university management, et cetera, and EPSLC and anyone else involved. Um, I guess one thing to stress as well is that there, there's rarely a right answer on trusted research. Um, whilst I've given you some examples of things that, that we may ask um, and may be relevant, every project and collaboration can be different um, just because of the, the nature of the project. So that's why we may have to have uh, conversations and they may be different about each individual project. Um, and finally, um, I'd encourage you to make use of the, the guidance and the expertise uh, that is available um, out there. So that was the last thing I was going to say. So thank you very much for listening. Happy to take any questions um, in the Q&A. And I'm now going to hand over to um, Sarah Key for, King from EPSLC, who is going to talk about the disabled, disabled stu student allowance. Hopefully I've said that right. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Just bear with me while I... Um start the uh, presentation. Go. Just double check that you've seen, yeah, you've seen the right screen. Okay, thank you very much for, for that, Katie. Um, my name is Sarah King. 
I'm a senior portfolio manager in EPSRC's studentships team um, with responsibility for um, training grants primarily within um, EPSRC. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity um, to just say a few words at um, this research office uh, webinar, just to raise some issues that we've been experiencing, not just within EPSRC, but across the other UK RI councils with respect to um, ESA claims. So in, in, in that, that again, um, so for anybody who's not been involved in this before, um, the uh, UKRI provides um, additional financial support to um, disabled UKRI funded students um, who uh, to support the expenditure that arises from their postgraduate studies. Um, and it's something that's um, with the, na the nature of which is um, incurred solely because of their disability. The um, Disabled Students Allowance or DSA as it's um, commonly referred to is harmonised, um, the processes are harmonised across all the research councils, so we all follow the same, um, the same processes. There is guidance and support available to, um, to the disabled students funded by UKRI, and all the arrangements for seeking the DSA funds are available um, under a DSA, a Disabled Students Allowance Framework, which is available from that link um, on our webpage. The slides, um, as Anne said, will be supplied later so that you will have these as, as a reference. The, the process that we operate at the moment is that claims need to be submitted between the 1st and the 31st of October annually, and they cover the academic year that has just ended. Um, so the, um, the claims that we will be processing in the next two couple of months will be for the academic year that started in on the 1st of October 2022 and ended in September um, 2023. Now, we uh, the DSA claims can be processed up to a month after the 31st of October due date without being rejected, um, but it would be really helpful for us if we can get the forms to come in and they can be, um, they can be sort of like completed and, and processed in a, in, in a much more efficient um, manner. The exception to the, um, the submitted dates of the 1st and 31st of October on an annual basis is where there is just six months or less remaining on the training grant, in which case that those DSA claims should not be submitted as normal. They should be submitted within the, um, the final expenditure statement for that grant. So disabled students allowance can't be backdated to cover costs that have incurred prior to that academic year in which the student is deemed el eligible for support. And the claim forms and the guidance on completing forms are again available on our website. We ask that a separate form for each student, each eligible, st eligible student should be submitted as an attachment and they're submitted via a standard um, JS grant maintenance request against the specific training group grant from which the student is actually funded. Um, we do we do see a number of um, grants where you've got multiple students on um, receipt in receipt of this DSA on a grant where there's more than uh, where there's a claims for more than one student. We ask that they are submitted concatenated together and submitted as a single multi-page document. The, um, the relevant council, they're submitted to the relevant council studentship teams who will then review the forms and complete um, and process. Um, if, the, if the forms are complete, then we'll process the claims as normal with the aim of payment in the specific council's next training grant pay run. As an example, the EPSRC training grant run, um, the net, the one that we would pay and pay them in is in January um, of each year. So we would we would be looking to pay in January 2024. Um, if the forms don't don't include the required information, um, they will either be rejected or returned to the ROs for clarification and correction. Over the last couple of years, the we have seen um, quite a significant increase in forms that are coming in 
um, that are then that they, they are incomplete. They contain um, the, the information they contain is not sufficient for us to actually process them. And the DSA process has been extended. We've not been able to pay a number of the claims even by January. So what I wanted to do is just take the opportunity to just raise the um, raise the awareness within sort of like the ROs of the of the, um, the common issues that um, that we are seeing. And we're not it's not just DPSRC. We're seeing it across the other councils as well. So on the, in the first instance, it's the claim details. Um, the forms have to state the grant reference number against the claim that um, the grant reference number that the claim is being made against and the academic year that the claim relates to. As I've said, claims covering multiple students need on a grant need to be collated into one document for submission. Um, student names, um, please can we have these included in full and, and can they, it seems, it seems strange, but can we make sure that they match the name of the student as it appears on JES? Because otherwise we just cannot reconcile um, the actual claim itself. We need to ensure that the student is registered at the organization listed on the form, on the grant, on um, as, as mentioned in JES, and also for the academic year that is detailed on the form. This is the this is the top of the uh, what what's on the bottom of this side here is just the, the top portion of the um, of the claim form. So it has the details there. Further down the form, we ask for details of special specialist equipment needs, which um, are eligible under um, under the DSA framework. So laptops are an eligible cost. But the form must indicate clearly in this comment section whether there's a standard £200 contribution from the student, which has to be deducted. You can see in the example, they have an example actually on the form of a laptop where the total cost is £450, but where in the field, as requested from the, um, from the Research Council, you can see that the £200 um, allowance has been taken off the students need to put that in, irrespective of their um, disability, they do need to make that standard £200 contribution. Students are eligible to be able to claim things like specialist equipment, such as desks, chairs, printers, that sort of thing. Um, they need to be individually listed on the form, not just specialist equipment. Um, they need to be individually um, listed on the form. They are only eligible if they are located at the student's private residence. Um, they, they, it's not eligible if the equipment is um, for the use of the student within their university. Um, we do ask for confirmation of the location um, to be included in the comments section of the form. Again, non-personal support, medical, non-medical personal support. Non-medical personal support is eligible as well, and this needs to be listed on the form. And we ask that you include the number of hours claimed and the associated hourly rate. Um, you can list the type of, um, it can be things like mentoring support, or it can be things like um, if a student has, um, has, has, has got a specific, specific specialized software package, it can be the training in that that's associated with them with them training to use that um, specific package. All students for DSA claims do have to have a needs assessment. Um, we are aware that there are a number of organisations who in the past have provided these assessments who have now closed down. Um, for audit purposes, we do still require a needs assessment to, be, uh, to have been carried out and the costs of those are covered. We don't need to see the needs assessment. It just needs to be um, actioned and organized by the, um, the research office. The, you, we, we quite often see um, undergraduates coming through who, have or, who already have a needs assessment, and it is perfectly acceptable for that needs assessment to carry on through with them to their postgraduate, um, postgraduate studentships. There are also cases where um, a student's 
needs change and evolve throughout the, their studentship. It could be a three or four year studentship. If their needs change, it is also possible to um, claim a revised needs assessment um, to make sure that they are getting the support that they require. The other, another aspect that, uh, with, with regards to non-medical personal support is additional travel costs. These are eligible under the DSA, and when the, it's when they are incurred by a disabled student. It does say mobility issues here, but it is also neuro, it also covers things like neurodiverse issues as well um, for students who may need to use taxis rather than public transport. DSA will provide the difference in cost between the taxi and the public transport. They won't just it won't just cover the full taxi fare. And the form does need to show where the public transport costs have been deducted. Um, in addition, the, this, we, would, we would ask that the disability advisor or officer or just a named contact should always be included on the form to allow us to go back and just double check um, anything that comes in. We do appreciate that the disabled so, uh, students um, allowance framework that is published on our website is not comprehensive. It doesn't cover every eventuality that we see with the students. Um, so what we would say is um, for those standard things that I've just discussed um, previously in the previous slides, that the, the much more simple things like, you know, putting the names of the students on, filling the formats correctly in the first place. If we can, if we can nail those and get those right, please do contact us if there is anything, um, any non-standard queries, um, contact your respective council. And we can um, we can help in um, we can help answer those. Just to reiterate, this year's DSA claims will continue to be submitted via JES. In the future, claims will obviously go through the funding service. But at this moment in time, we don't have any um, further details of um, of that process. They will come obviously in due course. And at the back of, and the tail end of the slides. Is I've included the DSA council contacts um, for um, for individual research officers to use. So I will close there and say thank you very much. Um, and we do appreciate that over the last two years, COVID has had a huge impact on both yourselves as research officers and um, within EPS or well and within UKRI as well. Um, but if we could moving forward. Um, we could work to um, to make sure that the, the DSA forms that are coming through can be actioned and processed and you can receive your payment as swiftly as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. I think it's over to me now. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Solsby from the Simpler Better Funding Programme, and I'm going to give you an update on UKRI's transition to the new funding service. And then I'll be followed by Louise Tillman, who's gonna talk more specifically about EPSRC's transition, and give you more details there. So I will share my screen. And get started. Um, so yes, through the Simpler Better Funding Programme, we're creating a new funding service that is easy to use and supports everyone involved in research funding. The service is being built in an agile and iterative way, which is in line with government digital best practice. This is an ambitious undertaking for UKRI and the research community for all of you that are having to interact with it. Um, and it is going to take some time before we see the full benefits of the new service um, so you'll continue to see the funding service being run in parallel with JES throughout 2023 and 2024, with fewer opportunities already running through JES that will continue to decrease uh, with, with more and more on the new funding service. The funding service is an important part of how we're aiming to reduce the unnecessary burdens currently involved in finding and applying for research funding. And over time, the checking and administrative burden imposed by JES um, and other sort of our system processes will ease under the new funding service as we're streamlining 
standardizing and introducing more consistency and predictability into this into that funding journey. I recognize that this has been a, a challenging period for some users of the service. There's not all the functionality is yet in place to, to say sort of reap some of those benefits. Um, and I think some users certainly had uh, experienced some technical problems with the service over the last um, couple of weeks, particularly around some of the larger deadline um, dates, which may have uh, prevented or delayed some submissions. So should an application be subject to a technical error, preventing it from being submitted successfully by the deadline, the project lead needs to contact the funding service help desk with evidence and a reason for that late submission. Um, and then that will be considered. Um, but as a matter of, matter of principle, the, we'll not be rejecting applications received late because of a technical error where it was the funding service um, was at fault. We recognise the anxiety and the stress that this will have caused to those users, particularly during the application deadlines, and we do take responsibility for those issues. Our programme team is working incredibly hard to resolve those issues, and we've contacted TFS uh, funding service administrators about um, extensions um, and where those improvements are being made. And our help desk team has been prioritizing support to applicants, particularly where the, those deadlines are imminent. And we've increased our resources or staff staffing resources um, for sort of those areas and particularly within our sort of development team as well. We're committed to ensuring an active dialogue with research offices um, and applicants and assessors and their organisations um, continue that sort of uh, and increase that active dialogue as we continue to deliver the service and implement it. One of the key things that we've introduced as part of that streamlining, standardising and sort of consistent journey is the core question sets. So since launching responsive mode on the service back in the spring, we introduced these core question sets for research grants, and this would expand to different funding types. These are the core question sets for applicants to complete um, within the application, and then they'll be assessed against. So you see that sort of uh, clearer distinction between sort of the application questions and the follow through to the assessment. Uh, it's a more intuitive digital sort of question and answer format, making it easier for applicants to explain their idea um, and easier for assessors to then review it as it's all sort of structured in, in that consistent way. There may be some additional requirements and that could be dependent on the time that the opportunity is launched. Uh, it might vary because it's a different funding type or because there's particular additional strategic needs for that opportunity. So as much as things are increasingly consistent. They're not going to necessarily be exactly the same uh, or completely standardized for sort of various good and important reasons. Okay, so grant rules was another thing that we introduced a few months ago. Um, and this was really to help widen the diversity of people um, and ideas um, that can be funded on UKRI research grants. The changes were first launched for responsive modes back in the spring, and we went from 35 different role types across UKRI to 12, which I've got listed on the side there in purple. You'll see there's some changes in terminology, moving away from uh, principal investigator to now the project lead. Um, so there was, there was quite a lot of variation um, across very similar terminology or very similar role types. So there's been quite a lot of analysis to, to drill that down to these different sort of core sets. These won't necessarily all be available for every opportunity. That will be determined by the, the team setting up the opportunities, which sort of role types will apply. But when an applicant goes in to, to complete their application, um, or when you go in to support the applicant, um, only the, the project um, only the role types that are applicable to that opportunity will, you'll be able to select from. So you won't need to, to worry about that. 
There's three new role types that have been introduced, which you may have noticed. The grant manager, professional enabling staff, and specialists. Um, these new roles are eligible for to attract indirect and estate costs. Um, and this is really to help address some of the financial barriers to research organisations investing in technical and specialist roles um, and really to sort of help with uh, career pathways. Although these roles are eligible to attract indirect and estate costs, applying for these costs remains at the discretion of the research organisation. Um, and there is additional information on our website that, that goes into a lot more detail around sort of the eligibility and the specifics of the, those roles uh, and, you know, what costings do apply. Something else, if uh, you may, may have noticed when um, supporting applicants uh, or if you've been to any of our other sort of webinars or seen our training videos is that the costing section is now just digitized um, and it's been streamlined quite a bit so we ask for a lot less information than we used to on the applications um, we did sort of a full analysis of what are the sort of key questions and what's the key information that's required on an application what's the sort of core set of things that um we would need um, to understand about sort of the costings and the level of detail for that breakdown. And there were quite a few sort of areas that, that no longer applied um, or were deemed sort of less useful. Um, so they've been stripped out and it's a much more sort of intuitive um, digital form. So as you go in and complete sections, um, you add sort of members, it'll carry that through to other parts of the form where you'll then need to add more details, say to for team members and that full sort of breakdown of costs. We have a, a few demonstrations on our website. Um, we did a uh, how to apply webinar recently for applicants and we've got a couple of training videos that go into more detail about how to complete these sections and how to complete an application. So if you're supporting applicants in that process, um, please do take a look at those and, um, or, and point applicants in that direction of those resources and some of those should be going into the, the chat as well. So you've got those links handy. A few things to keep in mind. So I already mentioned this, but some as much as we're streamlining and standardizing, some of those variations will continue because of the timing of when they were launched and what functionality or what policy um, sort of dis was in place at the time that that opportunity was launched. Um, there may be specific aims of that opportunity um, which require additional sort of strategic sort of, um, additional information for strategic needs and sort of different opportunity types by nature will have a slightly different um, sort of variation there. But so you are seeing that core, core consistency um, and that pull through of the application questions through to the assessment. Now on to the research office functionality. So there's quite a lot of stuff um, that's already been enabled as part of some of the real core functionality that we knew needed to be in place. Um, for you to support applications um, and project leads um, within your organization. There is more to come, um, particularly around, I know a lot of people uh, crying out for co-edit. So I'll come on to that in a moment. But certainly the, the key things was uh, to ensure that if all the, the research office administrators would have the ability to see all the applications um, from their organization from the moment that their first sort of started and created, allowing you to contact the, the project lead um, and to provide that support. Um, so you have that sort of visibility for your own internal processes, um, allowing you to monitor sort of volumes as they come through. Um, provides offline support where you can't do everything on the service just yet um, and you can sort of track the process uh, the progress of those applications as well um, and really importantly was at the point that the applicant the project lead is ready to submit the application it goes to the research office to do those final checks you can either return it back to the project lead who will make those changes or you can then submit it to UKRI 
but certainly having that stop gap um, for that final check um, was certainly a, a really important step. Um, and we've got an email address there, just in case it is get uh, our emails and notifications do get caught in people's spam folders, just to um, as a, a tip to add that to your contacts list. So I know co-edit and um, sort of groups functionality to help with um, submissions and managing your, the portfolio at your organisation are hotly anticipated and I'm really happy to say that the co-edit, um, certainly for um, co-editing for administrators at that submission stage. So once the project lead has completed enough of their application, they then submit it to the research office administrators. At that stage, um, research offices can then go in and edit all sections, um, change the finances or, or add to the finances, um, spell check, um, check for other sort of areas. Um, and, and yeah, what, whatever you need to do within those sections um, to get that application ready for submission, um, that will be opened up. And then, so that we're expecting in the next few weeks, certainly um, within the sort of very start of November. Um, and then that will open up um, beyond that before the end of the year to research office administrators being able to co-edit the application at any time pre-submission. Um, so supporting applicants um, throughout that sort of application generation stage. The other key thing will be the introduction of groups functionality. So groups will allow research offices the ability to create a group and then manage who from the research organization and um, so research office staff, support staff, department staff um, to be part of those groups to help coordinate who receives those notifications about the activity uh, and supports those applications, uh, specific applications. Um, to enable this, the project lead will have the ability to associate their application to specific um, groups, um, one or more, um, depending on sort of, uh, you know, the, the setup of the organisation. So you get to pick the structure of your groups, um, depending on how your um, organisation is set up. And um, that's in addition to this extensive testing that's already taken place for the design um, and to understand the user needs in that space, we're going to initially do some smaller pilots um, just before we go to that much wider release. But certainly you'll see uh, a lot more in place again before the end of the year, which will really help with notification and managing sort of your portfolios within your organization. We did some demonstrations of that group's functionality recently, um, which is recorded uh, and available on our website. We did those in partnership with Armour. I'm conscious of time and I don't want to, um, Louise to get angry with me for reducing her slot. So I'm going to try and speed up. But that was a key thing I really wanted to, to make sure you were aware of. Um, but in, in terms of preparing for those groups, check out that webinar to see what's expected, what's in the pipeline. So you've got an idea of what's coming in that space. Um, think about uh, who within your organization would be best placed to sort of lead on um, establishing who, what those groups should be and who would be assigned to those uh, and perhaps sort of start, um, yeah, putting that in place. Um, but certainly more information is going to be available on that to really sort of help support um, research organizations with the setup of that. There's lots of additional information on our web pages to stay up to date. A new page that we introduced in the last few weeks was a service updates page, which really has sort of updates um, when there was a couple issues with the service recently. Um, with access to the service, we put an update on there. Um, when there's sort of key updates on new release, fun new functionality release, um, we'll highlight it there as well. Um, and really sort of just sort of a, a good update page um where uh as like a like a holding notice 
We have quite a few recordings on our website as well and additional information. We have a webinar coming up soon as well on 7th of November and the link uh, to register will be going in the chat as well. Um, but if you don't manage to capture it, um, it will be available on the events on the UKRI events page soon as well. There's a whole host of training videos that we've already published online, depending on different sort of user groups and user types. Um, these are modular. We try and keep them sort of short and sweet and really sort of focused. Um, but as the service grows and develops, new functionality comes into place. Those will get updated. And where we find we get lots of questions, um, perhaps, um, you know, something just needs that a little bit of, uh, more of an explanation or support for, for users, um, we can go in and create sort of extra resources as well. Um, let's see. There is also a user briefing that we've sent out um, and is available online and we'll keep updating. And that in particular focuses on key information for applicants, research offices and reviewers um, with an FA uh, frequently asked questions in there as well. So as we get more questions, we'll keep that updated. Um, all of the research councils have a transition page which talks about their implementation plans um, and those get sort of updated um, every few months at sort of at, at key stages. So that's another good source of um, information to keep the rest of that. Um, we have a simpler uh, and better newsletter as well, which is a really great opportunity for us to to give you sort of updates as they happen and that's um becoming increasingly regular um as well as we've got a lot more that we want to tell you so please do subscribe to that newsletter um to stay up to date with that information and yes that was all from me so i'll stop sharing and hand over to louise thank you Thank you very much, Suze. And um, I'd never be crossing you, so <laughs> so it's fine. So um, I'm just going to share my slides. But um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Louise Tillman. I'm the Head of Business Improvement at EPSRC. And following on from Suze's broader update um, about um, transition to the funding service for UKRI, we're gonna, I'm going to focus today on EPSRC's transition to the funding service and how it's gone so far this year. So and hopefully answer some of the questions that have already been coming up in the Q&A um, as we go along, but we'll see how we do. So in terms of the content um, that I'm going to cover, it, first of all, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about completing some of the processing of JES applications and where we are with that at the moment, where we are with round one of EPSC responsive mode and fellowships, and our plans for round two um, for EPSLC responsive mode and fellowships as well, plus a little bit of a summary about where we are with other opportunities that have also gone live, live in TFS and how to find out some additional information about what's going on. So um, as many of you know, um, responsive mode and fellowship opportunities that were previously live in JES closed at the end of March. And this was because we were provided a target date um, to complete our sort of research grant and fellowship processing in JES um, by the end of this year. So across our response mode and fellowship opportunities, we saw between a three to four times the number of applications submitted in, in March 20, uh, 2023 compared to an average month. So we did see some peak of applications prior to the closure, as we expected. And we've been working hard to have a majority um, of these uh, applications processed um, and with a decision by the end of this year, with thematic panels held in July, September and October to process the applications that are already in the system, but also submitted during that peak in March. So in terms of round one um, EPSC response and mode and fellowships, so transitioning to TFS EPSC in collaboration with the SVF program made the decision to move our open response mode and fellowship um, opportunities into a series of consecutive rounds where applicants could still apply at any time, but applications would be batched for processing um, effectively um, through uh, running to sort of separate opportunities. And this was to help manage some of the ongoing system and quality changes that could not be made um, whilst an opportunity is actually already live. Um, so round one um, of our TFS opportunities opened in May 2023 and closed on the 2nd of October 2023 due to an extension due to the outage that occurred on the 27th of September. So to provide a little bit of context about where we are with the number of applications, we have seen a high 
volume of applications submitted across all of our opportunities and responsive maiden fellowships. Not necessarily surprising because there's a degree of pent up demand, um, plus deadlines obviously drive submission behavior to a degree as well. But we have seen volumes um, that are particularly high in our open fellowship and open, open plus fellowship scheme and our new investigator award opportunity, where we receive the same number of applications we would normally receive in a 12 month period for round one. Our postdoctoral fellowship scheme, we also saw a, a really large increase in the number of applications that we normally receive, um, with twice the number of applications we would normally see within a 12 month period. As a result of these high volumes, we will obviously need to adapt our processing timelines, and we're currently sort of building a picture of what that might look like. We will be batching the processing of applications by opportunity to help manage both internal resource, but also the pressure on the reviewer community. And EPSSC will be trying to apply some of the lessons that we learned in processing the peak of applications we received in the, um, after the closure on JES to try and make this um, uh, process as efficient as possible. We've also been trying to put in some auxiliary processes and systems to support our processing on TFS to try and streamline this as much as possible. We are proposing initially to focus on the processing of fellowships and new investigator awards. With fellowships, that's partly because of the two-stage process um, assessment process required um, to come to a decision. And we will need at least two waves of panels um, in order to support the decision making on the volume of applications that we've received. We will manage our budgets across um, both sets of panels to make sure there is no funding advantage to being processed either earlier or later um, in the panel rounds. But just to note, our budget is set by the spending review um, and due to the volumes, it is likely we may see lower success rates um, as a result of the higher volumes that we've um, seen in round one, specifically in particular opportunities. Our immediate um, priority is obviously to make the necessary adjustments we need to make to optimise the processing for round one. But I know that there's a lot of curiosity about what we're proposing to do with round two because we did not publish um, immediately on the 2nd of October as we had previously outlined. This is partly because we want to take a little bit of time and step back to revisit some options in terms of how we implement round two, given our experience with the volumes we've received in round one, plus also feedback we've received from yourselves um, over the last few months in terms of timing, staggering of closing dates and providing a better overview or longer term view of when applicants will be able to submit, et cetera. So we want to be able to provide that longer term view for you. So updated information will be found on the TFS transition webpage and hopefully on the funding finder in November. We've already put a holding statement on that. So if you've not already looked at that, please do. And we, within that um, transition page, we note that round two will not close before March, 2024, but there will be further updates in due course. We're working on it at the moment. In the meantime, applicants can continue to um, prepare to apply for round two. So on the transition web pages, we've highlighted some of the major changes that are coming up in round two. Main changes are that applicants will be able to embed images in some relevant sections, mainly the applicant and team section and the ethics and RRI section. Applicants will be able to input project partner details in a more structured format. So we're doing away with the table and we have a more structured um, data input and more comparable to what we had in JES. Um, and the application questions for overseas travel grants will change to a harmonised set that have been agreed cost council, which um, alter both the um, sort of questions and the assessment criteria under which that will be assessed. So in terms of reviewing on um, the new funding service, we expect review requests for responsive maiden fellowships to go out between the end of October to the end of January 2024. We've already started to warm up our college members via our college member newsletter over the summer. And we're also looking at other routes currently to help engage reviewers over the coming months. But if you have any members of your organizations that are interested in becoming college members or reviewing, um, they are welcome to self-nominate um, for our college. And we obviously will process our application as quickly as we can. Um, in terms of other um, opportunities that are already running on TFS, the vast majority of EPSC opportunities across our outlines, research grants and fellowships are now running on the new funding service. Um, a number of these are sort of, um, at the stage of either completing or running, uh, or sort of running through the sort of peer review process. Um, and we actually had our first EPSLC TFS panel um, last week. Um, and we're currently working with some of the TFS user researchers to help iterate and improve this functionality alongside the panel members um, who've um, been working with us. 
So in terms of EPSC channels to get updates um, around what's going on, as Sue's mentioned, um, we have the TFA EPSC transition web pages um, where we will try and update as regularly as possible um, what's going on in terms of EPSC's transition and what that journey looks like. Um, we include updates in the research community update and also in the quarterly briefing documents, um, which you serve universities. Um, we will hopefully obviously be publishing response and mode and fellowship opportunities on the funding finder um, when round two um, sort of dates have been finalised. Our um, sort of heads of regional engagement are also really happy to discuss um, any of your questions and issues around TFS and the transition. Um, and we are currently continuing to update some of the EPSLC um, applicant guidance web pages as well. It's quite a big job to do, <laughs> there's hundreds of web pages, but we're, we're sort of trying to work, work our way through them to make sure they provide up-to-date information for our applicants and reviewers.